tire change and coins. And when we go to the mission strip this year in November, whatever's in there, we're going to take that to give to the missions. So, uh, we've been doing it for a, every week for a couple of months, I guess now. And sooner or later, it's going to get enough in there that you stop hearing that that loud bang when the coins hit the bottom of the jug. Amen. Our singers will come on up when we get started. Sooner or later, it's going to get heavy. It's going to get heavy.
it's always good to bring God's tithes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. It's, uh, it truly is a privilege. It's not a, it, yes, it's a responsibility, but it's it's not a chore that we should be doing it begrudgingly. Like, oh, you've got to give, you've got to give up some more money. It's not yours to begin with. It all belongs to God. You have your job because you're blessed of God. Amen. You have your income because you're blessed of God. Yes, and he said, you whenever you have an increase, you bring me my portion first, and you keep the rest. And the rest that you keep will do more for you than if you had kept it all. Yes, Lord. Okay? So uh, it's, it's a good thing to bring God his tithes. Yes. Amen. So we're going to declare this, uh, this offering blessed, right? Amen. 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 Brother Freddie, would you pray with us? Well, first church service of the new year. So what does that mean? New vision statement? Maybe. I think so. So happy new years to all of you. Amen. We talked last week about new year habits and the creating and uh, New Year's resolutions, creating new habits, getting rid of bad habits. Uh, and today we're going to do something that I tend to not do. That probably has some of you saying, oh Lord, what is He going to do now? <laughs> we're going to do a series. Okay. Uh, how long is this series going to be? I have no idea until it's done. And I can say that, you know, I tend, I don't make my messages or God's messages way in advance. I don't believe in that. God changes things too much for me to make sermon outlines a year in advance. Hallelujah. But with our 2022 vision statement, mission statement, whatever you want to call it, it's kind of encompassing, so we can fit a lot of stuff into it. And we mentioned it the other night. The 2022 vision statement for Lindsay Grove Church is uh, take the ground. Okay? Take the ground. And too many times in our life, we have given up ground. Right? I just call it take the ground. So, there's a lot of ground that the church in general has given up to Satan, to the world. Well, this year, we're going to take it back. See, whenever Adam was created, he walked in the garden with God. He talked with God the Father, just like we talk with each other. Okay, He did not walk through the garden and pray and wait for God to speak to his heart. He talked to him just like we talk to each other. He had that type of relationship. And then Adam did something. Adam sinned. Okay, let's take care of this right off the start. Don't blame it on Eve. Eve is not the reason. Adam is. When Adam took of the fruit, sin entered into the world. The, the woman, the Bible refers to as the weaker vessel, she took of the fruit. Sin did not enter into the world. She gave fruit to Adam. Adam was the one that was placed in charge, Right? Whenever the headship or the authority position took of the fruit, that's whenever sin entered into the world. And that relationship with God changed forever. Yes. A lot of ground was given up right there to Satan. And that doesn't change. Today, people are still losing ground. They're giving up ground either because of the sins that they're committing or they're giving ground to Satan, just giving it away. For different reasons. Ignorance, lack of knowledge. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay? There's no excuse if you're a Christian 
for more than a short period of time, if you have the Bible, if you have some way of getting the gospel, whether you listen to it, you watch it, or you read it, there's no more excuse. Okay? Laziness is not an excuse. So we, we've given up the ground. And this year, we as a church, we're going to take it back. This year, we as an individual, we're going to take it back. See, little things... Anybody ever watch military movies or documentaries? Okay, I do. Brother John let me borrow the whole series, documentary series on uh, <coughs> Vietnam. Uh, and I watched a big part of that on my computer. We didn't watch it as a family on TV. Uh, I watched on the computer. And I've watched those same documentaries on World War II and different things. And you know what they do? Some of you were, were there. They try to take the ground. When they would push the enemy back, they took the ground that they possessed. And when they pushed the enemy further back, they took more ground. Same concept spiritually. That's what we're talking about today. We're going to take back the ground that has either been lost or given away to Satan. Both in our lives and as a church. When we started the study of the miracles of Jesus, I don't believe it was an accident. I told you I didn't have all the answers at that time as to why we're focusing on the study uh, of the miracles of Jesus, but I now know. Okay, It's preparing us. We're in a state of preparation right now to take back the ground of spiritual authority, of anointing, and power. There is zero reason on this planet why Satan should be running rampant over us as an individual and over our homes. We have authority over him, not vice versa. But over time, yeah. over time, you know, if, if I start out right here and Satan is attacking me, all the different ways that he does it, and, and I just take one little step, He's gained that much ground. Over a period of time, if I keep just taking little amounts and backing off a little bit at a time, well, over a period of years or months, look at how much ground Satan has gained because I'm the one that's backed off. That's mine. That is my inheritance. That is my possession given to me of God. I'm taking it back. So... Are you prepared for this journey? Are you going to take back the ground that's been lost or given away? It all comes back to knowing who you are in Christ. That's coming in the future. Knowing who you are in Christ. Yes, you know what I think, this is Dustin's opinion, what I think the number one problem is with the Christian and the church We've got comfortable. I'm not talking about the new Christian, the new convert, because it's all new to them. But those of us that's been living this life for a while, we've got comfortable. Comfort turns into laziness. Right? If y'all here see one of them crickets chirping, going down the aisle, step on it, please. <laughs> Comfort turns into laziness. And then what happens? Brother Dustin, will you pray for me? I will. Have you prayed for yourself? No. I'll pray for you with you at the same time. Or you can go home and pray, and I'll pray after you've prayed for yourself. Okay? Yes, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for anybody. But we got to start praying for ourselves. We can't rely on everybody else. Amen. But the crutch of the modern day church is let somebody else do it. What's going to happen when the somebody else has run out? Let's just get right down to the nitty gritty in this church. We're predominantly an older generation church. What's going to happen when the brother Walters are not with us anymore? that spend hours and hours on their knees praying? What's going to happen when the brother O'Neills, the brother Johns, 
the, the older generations that's been there and they've seen these things, they've experienced these things, what's going to happen when they're not here anymore? Who are we going to lean on? Who are they going to lean on? Who's the next generation going to lean on? They're going to lean on us. And we're saying, don't lean on me because they're not here to lean on anymore. It's time for us to take back the ground that we've lost. Yeah, okay? Hallelujah. Amen. Stop being comfortable. Stop being lazy. Stop letting these little things creep up on us. Okay? Those little things eventually turn into big things. Right? Y'all ever watch these cartoons where they have a little snowball and they throw it down a hill? What happens? That little snowball runs over houses. Okay? They grow quick. So turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And as, we, as you're turning, keep in mind I talked about the first Adam losing ground. The second Adam, which is Jesus, whenever He went to that cross and He was crucified and He died, He was buried and He resurrected and that veil was rent. It was tore from the top down. Jesus did the very thing that we're doing this year. He took back everything that Satan had possession of that man had given him Jesus took it all back and He came and He gave it all back to His people. He said, now here is this great blessing. Now use it. And over time, the church and individuals, individual Christians, we've got comfortable, we've, we've took a little stutter step. Anybody ever watch football? I'm not a football fan. I don't care. But I still know the concept. You get this army tank right here and another one over there, and they're going to come together and they're going to butt heads and try to get past each other. Right? Well, what about that great big guy? 350 pounds of muscle that gets past that front line, and this little skinny quarterback that's supposed to be throwing the ball sees this massive man coming at him. What's happening? He's fixing to lose some ground. He's going to get knocked about 10 feet yonder way, right? Yeah. We can't do that. The Bible says when you've done all you can do to stand, when Satan is coming against you and he's, you know, Paul, I think Paul used the word uh, berate. He, he's just been beat and hit constantly. And you're taking little stutter steps backwards every time you're getting hit. When you've done all you can do to stand, you've got to plant yourself and you've got to stand. Satan can come at you, but you're going to be unmovable. Okay? That's what we're supposed to be, is unmovable in Christ. Stop, stop taking the steps backward. Okay? If we're not moving forward, at least stop moving backward. Take your stand. So let's look at this. Uh, today, we're going to talk about take the ground, besetting sins. Take the ground, part one, of however many we do. I don't know. But we're going to talk about the besetting sin. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction or uh, opposition of sinners. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Oh, woe is me. Satan is after me. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Satan is knocking on my door. He's giving me a hard time. Have you resisted sin and resisted Satan to the point of bloodshed? 
I hadn't. Paul did. Yes. Right? Hallelujah. Peter did. Disciples did. Jesus did. I hadn't. So we, uh, we whine and we complain a little bit. But if you've not yet resisted Satan and resisted sin to the point that it costs you bloodshed, have you really suffered that much? Just think about it. Verse 5, And ye have, uh, ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Well, that's a problem right there because nobody wants to be rebuked anymore. Nobody wants to be told they're wrong. Right? Yeah. Well, y'all just told on yourself. No, no, it's against the human nature. We don't want to be told we're wrong. I'm right. Yes, yes. Uh, verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, or he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof, are, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But, God, but He, God, chastens us for, a, for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Well, isn't that the truth? Yes. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hallelujah. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Amen. We're going to stop right there. Let's go back to verse 1. Whereby seeing also... We also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Okay, let's just dig into this a little bit. These, these witnesses, when you look, you know, I like to look at the Greek word. This is martyrs. Those that's already gone on before us. And they've given their life for the cause of Christ. Yes. Okay, wherefore seeing we also are compassed or we're surrounded or encircled with so great a cloud of martyrs, those that's already walked this walk, they've had this life, they've lived the life where people hated Christians, they've been murdered for being Christians, they know exactly what we're dealing with. Yeah. They probably, many of them know more than what we're dealing with, right? He says, let us lay aside, this is instruction, folks, let us lay aside every weight. What's a weight? It's a hindrance. It's a hindrance and it's a burden. There is a difference in a hindrance and a burden. But if you let the hindrance stay there, the hindrance will turn into a burden. Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you're driving down the road and they put up a, a detour sign and you're stopped here, you're going to have to turn and do a detour. And you can see where you want to go. I just want to go to that store right down there. Now, you're going to have to go around, take ten turns, wait in line because a whole line of traffic's trying to detour. The whole time you're looking at your destination, saying this sign is all that's in the way. Perfect example. Where Gracie has karate class, you, you go to Pulaski and you go down, uh, what, 2nd Street or something, and they've been doing road work. And they had a detour sign. The driveway to where she had to go was just right there. 
But if you obeyed the detour sign, you had to take a side street, another side street, another side street, and come out right there and just turn in the driveway. There was nothing being worked on right there between it. But that sign was there because on down the road, they're doing construction. Okay, Gracie's like, well, you need to go this other road. Daddy went around the detour sign and went down the road. <laughs> you want to know why? I listened one time. Mama goes this way. Mama in the smaller vehicle goes up here and turns on this little side road that's like a logging road slash pig path, okay? So daddy goes this way and we meet a vehicle. They ain't nowhere to go. So I'm like off in the ditch fixing to get in somebody's yard. After that point, no. Detour sign, scoot over. We go straight point is these little hindrances if this might be a bad example of not obeying the detour sign but these little hindrances had I continued to go around limb slapping my truck my truck took up the whole road okay over time with it getting dark there's a good possibility of an accident this little hindrance could have turned into something bigger Okay, I, there's other ways of going, but that route to me became a hindrance. But the detour sign was a hindrance. The possibility of this turning into something bigger was very real. The little things that we let come up in our life, okay, personal things, attitudes, don't raise your hand, but any of us got an attitude? Let me put mine down. Okay, you ever heard that expression, don't poke the bear? There's a reason somebody said that. Okay, anybody ever goosed your, you know what a goose is? Okay, <laughs> sorry. I have fun with Brother Terry because, I've yeah. Gooses and got goose. yeah, okay. You ever goosed your dog? Any of them whirled around and tried to bite you? I can look at my look at hers and get bit. You ever goosed a horse? You kicked it in the flanks. What happened? Usually they flew loose to bucking. They didn't like it. Okay. These these little things, these little attitudes that we all have, can just for no reason can spur up if we let them. You know. The devil knows how to push our buttons. Y'all seen the cartoons of the big red button that says do not push? And that's an invitation. It's a requirement at that point that who, Bugs Bunny has to push the button. You know, Daffy Duck has to push the button. He can't help himself. Satan knows you've got that big red button. And he don't just push it. He jumps up and down on it. He stomps on it. He does a little tap dance on it. He does all these things. This is real. It happens to all of us. He knows a lot of our hindrances. He knows how to, Brother O'Neill mentioned this morning, get under our skin. He knows how to get under your skin. So we have some choices. We can give in to that. We can yield to whatever hindrance has taken place. And we can get mad about it. We can have an attitude about it. We can take it out on somebody else. We can jump on the telephone and start Gossip Central. But we don't do that. You, so many options. And let's be real. You can't, we're not telling on anybody. Just think about yourself. Be real. What do you do when these little hindrances happen? Okay, I'll confess to y'all, me... Oh, I get frustrated. Some of the stupid stuff I put up with at work, it's no stranger to my house to hear me hit the table. I'm like, ah! And it's, you know, get it out of my system. How do we deal with these things? If we let it build, 
if we don't put a stop to it, these little hindrances will turn into a burden. And then this little hindrance that I didn't stop is now weighing me down. Okay? Yeah. That's the weight. It's getting heavy. So these lay aside every weight, every hindrance, uh, every thing that can weigh us down and come between us and God. We need to put them aside. How do you put them aside? Go to the Comforter for direction. Rebuke. Some, number one, submit yourself to God. Number two, this is all in the same verse. Submit yourself to God. Rebuke the devil. Yes. And if he feels like it, he'll leave you alone. Is that what it says? No. 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 Part number three says, if you do the first two things, then the results will be the third thing. If you submit yourself to God and rebuke the devil, then he'll flee from you. Yes. He has no choice. This goes back to knowing who we are in Christ. This goes back to knowing and understanding your anointing, your power, and your authority. Amen. Because if we do the first two things and we understand what we're doing, we don't even have to do anything else. The devil's going to know, okay, this person understands who they are. They understand their rights, authority, and ability, and their power through Christ Jesus, and I can't do nothing about it. Amen. So I'm going to go down the road and mess with somebody else. He knows. So when these hindrances come up, I know in the flesh it is easy to give up and just get mad, be frustrated, do whatever it is that we do. But we have a remedy, and if we'll take advantage of that, we'll rebuke Satan, yes. then these weights and these hindrances, these burdens, they'll be gone. Right? What are we supposed to do with burdens? Put them at the foot of Jesus. Uh, what is it? Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come un This is Jesus talking. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Amen. Carrying around weights and burdens, it weighs you down. It makes you tired. It, there's a reason it's called a burden, right? Jesus said, bring that to me. I'll take care of that and I'll give you rest. Now, the next part of this verse in Hebrews 12 and 1. Uh, instruction 1, lay aside every weight and, that means there's something else, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Huh. What does beset mean? It means to entangle. So lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us. Well, Brother Dustin, I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I no longer have sin that I get entangled with. The Word of God just clearly spoke to you and said, so easily. It doesn't mean that you do submit to the sin or that you yield to the temptation. But what He's saying is, it is very easy for us to do it. Just because you're a born-again believer does not make you immune to sin. Amen. It does not make you exempt from sin. Yes. Okay? That's why we have the advocate. So whenever you do commit a sin, you can repent and you can move on. Okay? But this besetting sin, this sin that we're so easily entangled with, uh, we're all tempted in different ways, right? Yeah. So let me tell you how Satan works. Jesus was tempted in every way just like we are, right? Amen. Jesus took this little fast where he didn't eat for just a few days. How many days did Jesus fast? Forty, Forty, days. 40 days. Think about that. Some of us can't fast 40 minutes. Forty days. He was in a fleshly body just like me and you. Amen. And his fleshly body was screaming at him, I'm hungry. 
So he had to defeat the flesh, right? And Satan, with temptation, came to Jesus and said, just turn that rock in, I think he said, turn that rock into bread. Okay? Feed the flesh. Take care of the flesh. Because that's where I like to operate. Satan likes to operate in the flesh. Feed that flesh. So A, Satan is stupid. Okay? Tempting Jesus. Or B, he's really brave. And there's a fine line between brave and stupid for some people. Okay? If Satan is willing to do that, whether he's brave or stupid, I don't, you pick. If he is willing to tempt Jesus, knowing who Jesus was, don't you think he's going to tempt us too? Sure so. Oh, yeah. And over the years, he has learned from each one of us, oh, that, this person, they, they struggle with this. Now, they struggle with temptation in this area. They struggle with sin in this area. So that's where that big red button comes in. He starts pushing that button. Right? So that sin which doth so easily beset us or so easily entangle us, Satan knows how to push that button. It's not impossible for a Christian to sin. So what does that mean? That means don't be entangled with it. It's easy. Sin is literally one thought away. Sin is one word away. We've got to keep ourselves from it. Right? Yes. But the temptation is there. It is easy. Especially when the attitude, the anger, the frustration, is whenever that's raging, when we get in a fleshly situation, it's even easier to get entangled in sin. So he's giving us warning. Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Well, what about, uh, what about when we're not having these types of problems? How can we get entangled into a little sin? We all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. I want to introduce you to an old sin. It's been around for a long time. It's been around so long the Word of God warns us about it. But yet, you slap a little makeup on a pig and uh, what's that one on the Muppet Babies? Miss Piggy. You know, you know she's got to be all decked out and dressed out fancy with her lipstick and her makeup, you know, chasing the frog down. You, you can put this makeup on a pig, but underneath that, it's still a pig, right? You can paint the polecat hot pink, and you'll still smell it before it gets there. Doesn't matter how you camouflage it or disguise it, sin is still sin. Yeah. And there's this sin that's been around a long time that because of COVID the world slapped some new paint and a new camouflage on top of the sin and people accepted it. Right? Yes. Y'all know where I'm going with this. If you've ever listened to me. Forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. In other words, there's a reason that we go to church. So the Word of God tells us, go to church. Fellowship with your brethren. Learn and grow from the Word of God. Amen. How can you hear without a preacher, and how can he preach without he being sent from God, right? Amen. So how do we keep people from hearing? Just keep them from going to church. Because church is where we get sick. I've heard that one a million times. You can't go to church because that's where you catch COVID. People that's never been to church a day in their life got sick with COVID. They didn't get it at church. But they camouflaged it. They disguised that sin. And now it's crept up on people. Now we're how many? We two years into this thing? How many people still don't go to church because they stopped going when COVID started? It sneaks up on you. And before long, the sin which does so easily beset you the sin which does so easily you get entangled with, 
for people that can't do that, they sure ain't at church. Something to think about. So, Satan, Satan's working, folks. Are we going to let him keep that ground? No. Take it back. Take it all back. Don't settle for a little. Don't compromise with sin and compromise with Satan and compromise with the world and say, well, I'll give up 20 feet my lifetime. I'll just take back 10 and you keep 10 and we can both be happy. That ain't the way it works. This is what I'm anointed to do. This is what all Christians are anointed to do. We're called. So do what we're called to do. And giving up the ground to Satan is not what we're called to do. Take it back. Okay? You, you want to see some dog fights in the world? You start talking about ground. Oh, you'll see some ugly come out of people. Go get the tape measure. You're an eighth of an inch on my property. Sorry? Scoot that leaf back over here that I knocked over there, you know. It's real. People get all bent out of shape. But when we're talking about spiritual property, people tend to get very relaxed. Oh, it'll be okay. God's got this. God give you instruction, you better get this. This is your job too. This is my job too. Take back the ground that we've lost. Let's, I'll use the property that we live on. Long before my time ever came up, they did this thing called surveying. Guess what happened in the survey? Five acres of my family's property disappeared somewhere. You know what? It's still back there. It didn't just disappear. It didn't run away. It's still there. Somebody just can't draw a straight line on a picture. Okay, That's what it boils down to. The ground is still there. Well, the spiritual ground that the church and many Christians have given up, that ground is still there. But it's being occupied by somebody that it does not belong to. Take it back. It belongs to me. This is my family ground. This is church ground. This is spiritual ground. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Hallelujah. You think Satan's uh, on that holy ground with his shoes off, worshiping and praising God because he's on holy ground? No. He's on it laughing and mocking because this is that Christian's ground and I've got it. Take it back. Okay? It is not Satan's. It is ours. So, instruction, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and they keep throwing ands in here and we're going to have a lot of responsibility, ain't we? Yeah. And let us run with patience. Okay? The race that is set before us. Well, this word patience does not mean patience the way that we typically think of it. It means endurance. Run the race with perseverance. Run the race with endurance. Okay? Doesn't mean just walk the spiritual walk very casually saying, well, I'm being patient. I'll get there sooner or later. No. You know how bicycle racers, cyclists, and marathon runners, you know how they run those races with endurance? Huh? They work on it. Okay, they work on that. They uh, they prepare their bodies for that type of use. Christians better be preparing our spiritual bodies yes, yes. for the type of use that God has called all of us to do. Okay, sitting on padded pews. Let me include myself here. Sitting somewhere that's padded and comfortable, that's not part of your calling. But you know what it can do? If we get to enjoy this padding too much, it can cause us, it can be a hindrance. Right? Yes. What happens when we get too comfortable? What happens when, when daddy gets too comfortable in his soft recliner? Huh? 
No. He goes to sleep. What happens when his wife says he's, she's had enough of that? She drags him around the driveway, the circle drive, and makes him walk a mile. What does she have to do in return? Listen to him gripe and complain. We get comfortable in these padded pews. We get comfortable. We got to stop. Get up. I mean, this is the, the, to me in my life, it's the perfect example. Whenever I coon hunted every week, okay, if you've ever been around the hills and hollers around here, they get steep. And we would, I was the coon hunter when you opened the dog box. Wherever the dog went, I went. I didn't sit on the tailgate and wait. So I walked in the woods at night up and down hills and hollers for hours. I was a pretty healthy little feller. Now, uh, lapping my driveway enough times to make a mile, and I feel like I'm dying. Well, why is that? Well, my body is not in the same condition it used to be when I was using it. Now it sits at a kitchen table and works all day and then spins around to the personal computer desk and works all night. Muscles we don't use, we lose. Well, there you go. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? Muscles that we don't use, we lose. Spiritual abilities that we don't use. Do we lose the abilities? No, I don't really think we lose the abilities, but we use the ability to use the abilities. Not knowing who we are in Christ means I can't truly rebuke Satan 100% and confidently know that he's going to flee. Yeah, I believe he's going to. I know the Bible says He's going to, so I'm going to take that stand. But whenever we get to the point in Christ that we know without a shadow of a doubt, I can sit on this pew and to the point my shoulders is touching Satan that close and look over at not even have to, to speak it, just look over at Satan and he'll be like, oh man, i got to go. So he leaves. Getting to that point is what I'm talking about. Yes, we can speak it. We can command it. And I believe it will happen. But it's not losing that ability. It's how much more powerful with that ability I could be if I would keep working at it, keep being persistent, keep enduring, rather than not doing it. Right? I keep saying I need to get this fleshly body in better shape back like it used to be five years ago, three years ago. It only takes one thing. What happened to make me stop coon hunting? When I messed my knee up and had surgery. And what happened? I quit hunting. It took one incident in my life that literally changed the abilities of this body. Spiritually speaking, that hindrance may be the only incident in your life, the only thing that it takes to weaken you spiritually to the point that we're not doing what God's called us to do. So He's telling us to lay it aside. If you're a born-again believer, the old man belongs on that cross. He does not belong living and working in our life today. Put him back on that cross. Put her back on that cross. Whatever. All right. I want to get to one more point real quick. Um, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. The opposition of sinners. As Christians, we're going to receive opposition from the sinners. Amen. The world is against us right now for the way that we choose to live. Until they need us. Some in the world, whenever they reach a certain point, they're like, okay, I need to find 
so-and-so Christian. I need to find the church. I need to find the preacher. I can't handle this no more. They know, okay? But the last part of verse 3 says, Lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yeah. Okay, that's the methods. That's his schemes. That's how he works. But this is telling us not to be wearied and faint in your minds. I've always heard it said, the mind is the devil's playground. Don't get wearied. Don't get tired. Okay? Okay? Don't answer this one out loud, but if you've ever been that person that's for anything, you've said, okay, look, I'm tired of dealing with this. I, I give up. Okay? I, I, I'll confess to you. I can do that as the pastor and so be it. Y'all don't tell on yourselves. I've got to the point with certain things in my life that there come a time I said, okay, I'm done. I give up. I'm through fighting with it. And I think at some point, most of us have had places in our life that we've did that. Spiritually speaking, we cannot do that. Satan is going to come against us with everything he can. He's not satisfied with the spiritual ground that he has taken or been given from us. He wants more. Okay? And the more he can just beat on us and push us and shove us, he wants us to say, okay, I'm done fighting, I give up. Oh, he's, he's as happy as he can be because God's people has given up. Used to on Wednesdays, I would do some, uh, I would start the service out, you know, and I'd give you some news clippings, things in the Christian world. And if you remember in the last few years, I can't remember their names, but how many people that made Christian headlines because they renounced their faith in God. They said, I'm no longer going to be a Christian. I mean, singers that people bought and listened to their Christian albums all the time. One of them was a preacher and a pastor of a church just giving up and saying, okay, I'm, I'm done fighting with this. I'm no longer a Christian. Don't do it. It, this life as a Christian is not going to be easy. Amen. But the rewards for fighting this battle is going to be far greater than anything our minds can even imagine. Amen. God is never going to give you something you can't handle. You just got to make it to the end. You got to endure. He's all, before we go through it, He knows what's going to happen. As we're going through it, He's there with us. And when we come out on the other side, He's still there. Never going to leave us. Never going to forsake us. Amen. But you have this new word, influencers. Okay? They like to call certain things on the internet an influencer. Meaning they, uh, they do a lot of stuff and a lot of people watches them. And it influences their lives. Makes sense. The people that I'm talking about they had a following. People in the congregations, Christians around the U.S. listening to their music. And then they say, I'm done. I'm no longer a Christian. I quit. Oh, he's loving it. It's one of his schemes. It's one of, the, one of the methods. And we're not supposed to be ignorant to the way that Satan works. If we're going to take back the ground that we can live a joyous, righteous, holy life that God has called us to live. Look, when you were in school and you had a project, you wanted to get the smart kid in the class to be on your team to help you. Right? Right? When you're at a job and you have to partner up with somebody for something, you want to get the person that's good at that job to be on your team to help you. Because that gives you that feeling of like, oh, man, this guy knows what he's doing. This is going to be okay. You know, at, at work, when I have certain problems with programming or databases, 
if I can't figure it out, I know the right people to go to because they can make it happen. We're supposed to be that person for the world. When they've got to their end, to their limit, we're created with a spiritual capacity for spiritual things. Okay, That's the way God designed us. The world is trying to shove things in there that doesn't fit. But just watch certain people as they're hitting challenges and roadblocks in their life. They come to a point, they start thinking or considering about church. It's, it's hard-coded into who we are. Okay? Even the atheist at some point in their life has had to consider God and church. When these people reach that point in their life, they're going to be looking for that person to get on their team, for that person to partner with. They're going to be looking for the church that's doing what the Word of God says and standing against sin, not compromising. They're going to be looking for a church where the Spirit moves and the Spirit works and the Spirit operates freely, not a compromising church that scratches the back of the world. They're going to be looking for what they truly need. That's what we're supposed to be. That's what this church is supposed to be. And for us as individuals and a church and as, as a body to do that, we've got to take back ground that we have lost. Hallelujah. Are you going to do it? I'm going to put you all on the spot. If you will work with me together as a body and we're all going to work together to take back ground, let me hear you say Amen. Amen. If you're not going to do it, let me hear you say, oh me. If you don't know the question, say what? All right. So you all admit you heard the question and I heard no oh me's. So we're all on board. We're going to take this back. We're going to take it by the Word of God. And by the end of this year, our wisdom, knowledge, and understanding about our anointing, our authority, and our power in God is going to grow exponentially. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And by the end of 2022, this church and each one of us as an individual, we're going to be a force to be reckoned with anytime Satan wants to stick his head up. Yes. Amen. Do we agree? Yes. We are a victorious people in Christ. We are not called to be cowards in the Lord's army. We are called to be formidable, powerful opponents against Satan. We are who we are by the grace of God. We are what He created us to be. And we're going to live that life. And we're going to start right now taking back that ground that does not belong to Satan. It is mine. This is holy ground. And we're going to live it. Let us stand. Does anybody want to be prayed with? Amen. Nope, nope. You're, you're jumping the gun. I was about to say, has anybody got a hand? Raise it up. And if you got another one, raise that one up too. Okay? It's all right to pray with your arms up. Lord, we come to you right now, Lord. I want to thank you for this day. Lord, I want to thank you for yet another year, Lord, that we have come together as a church and as a body of believers. And I pray right now, Lord, that You speak to the hearts and minds of everybody under the sound of my voice, whether it's in church or it's on the internet, Lord. Speak to our hearts and give us, Lord, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we need right now. That we can dig into Your Word and we can truly understand who we are in You. That we can understand our anointing. We can understand the power and authority, Lord. And I pray right now that You help each one of us take back the lost ground. Lord, help us to think on this every day. Every day, Lord, take back what we've lost. Take back what Satan's got that does not belong to him. And I ask you, Lord, to just let that surge through our bodies, Lord. Take back the ground that we can be what you've called us to be, Lord. We're going to be a power that this world has never witnessed. We're going to be what you've called each of your people to be all through time. And that is to be that vessel, that tool of choice that you use to do mighty works and mighty wonders and miracles throughout this world. So Lord, I pray right now that you open up the ears of our hearts and our understanding that we can receive what it is you have for us. And help us, Lord, to start growing. 
growing like we've never grown before and get closer to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, wait. Don't run off. What's wrong with y'all? You say amen and they run out the door. No, I'm joking. They're giving some weather this evening. Whether or not it gets here, y'all know how this works around here. It might not even get here. As of now, we're having church. So use your own discretion. You know we have two hills in a driveway that get slick. So use your own discretion. If it does turn out to start icing at like 3 o'clock or something, uh, we may call it off. If we do, we'll start the prayer chain and do the person to person to make sure we all get it. Okay? Yeah, we're not calling off service. So uh, I'm trusting. Look, we got too much good stuff to be getting. So it is. I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it.